Welcome to Beyond the OR with Dr. Kevin Brenner. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills. I wanna take you beyond my world of plastic surgery, diving deep into exciting hot topics and delving even deeper into compelling characters that I've met along the way. We'll be talking with attorneys, actors, comedy writers, Navy SEALs, and many other fascinating and inspiring people with truly intriguing stories to share. So let's jump right in. Welcome back to Beyond the OR with Dr. Brenner. Today, Elizabeth and I have a very special guest. I've been wanting to get him in the studio for at least a year. Uh, we have Sean Berman. Welcome, Sean. Sean is the uh, Sean is the director of operations at Cell Surgical Network. He hails from Amherst College, uh, where he graduated. He was playing football, and then and then went to Louisiana for his uh, master's degree. And he now uh, kind of runs and operates Cell Surgical Network, and. Uh, we're really excited to have him because today we're going to be talking about all things stem cells. So, Sean, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me here. It's good to be I with mean, you. I it's, mean, it's really nice to have you here. So, uh, we got a lot to talk about. I'm, I'm super interested in this topic for selfish reasons uh, because of what I do for a living. Um, but I want to know from you, and we'll kind of start at the beginning and move along. How did you get into stem cells? Um, my, really, my father was an inspiration. Um, he started, he was working with fat, doing facial fat transfer since I think like 1986. Yes. And as you know, fat has a ton of stem cells in it. So when they would, you know, put fat in your face, you get this result and then it would settle and it would kind of come somewhere in between. And the more they learned about fat, they're like, hey, well, there are these really cool cells in here. I think there's something to it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he ended up going to Japan in 2009 and they were taking uh, fat out from these real small women and then taking more fat out from them, isolating those stem cells, adding it to the fat, that cell-assisted lipo, and using it for breast enhancement. And he's like, wow, like, isn't that a waste of stem cell? You take these really tiny women to make their breasts a cup size larger and you take all the fat off their body? I could do that easily with an implant, but maybe there's something therapeutic that we could do there. So he started going down that path, and that's when I, I was pre-med undergrad, and I was you know, just learning about the stem cell really for the first and, time. And this was roughly what year? Uh, 2009, 2010. Okay. Yeah. And as things progressed, he started doing this stuff in, in clinic, and I'm learning about it. And I first really got into it when I went to Louisiana Tech. Um, I went to go play my last year of football, last year of eligibility. He looks like a quarterback. He, he does. <laughs> I, 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 it's, like, it's like Tom Brady uh, sitting here. Right. You guys are blowing me up right here. My head's going to explode. <laughs> but no, so I go to Louisiana Tech, and as I get to summer uh, training camp, that was when the NFL Players Association settled their $765 million lawsuit with the NFL over a concussion. Wow. And you start looking at it. My buddies that were playing and rolled an ankle. There were 30 things that they were doing to treat their ankle. But if you got a concussion... They'd put you in a dark room and tell you to wait there and not do anything until you felt better. You're like, wow. 30 right. things for my ankle, nothing for my head. I was like, there's got to be a solution. So I, I obviously knew a lot about stem cells from my father and what he was doing. And I'm in this you know, cell biology program. I was like, hey, maybe there's something we can do for concussion where we can use the properties of stem cells to start taking care of that. So that's how I got started. With that, and then it just kind of spiraled downhill from there. Right. But... but Concussion is not unique to football. I mean, we, it's, it's widely known because of football, but there's a much larger application in the military, yeah. right? and which is, which is a, a bigger interest of mine than football, sorry. No, know, it should be a bigger interest of everybody because the military personnel are actually protecting us and keeping us safe, and football people are just entertaining us. Right. So, so, you know, in the last five years or so, traumatic brain injury in our veterans and even our, in our active duty uh, military has become a huge topic and how to treat that. Um, I have various friends who were in the military, some of whom had PTSD, some had traumatic brain injury, um, and... You know, it's kind of like the Wild West. They're kind of searching themselves because, let's face it, our VA healthcare system um, is in desperate need of is, help. Is not helpful most of the time, and um, and so to have uh, to have something that's sort of like a set up network specifically for that is super helpful, right? Absolutely. And you guys recently, I'm saying you guys. Was it, is it CSN that yeah. has the, the grant? Yeah, Cell Surgical Network. 
So, so tell me about the grant and how that came about. Yeah, so when you look at, I'm, I'm gonna pick on you right now because you're, you're, I mean, you're a doctor. Every, and everyone else does, on, we <laughs> everyone does. So, all right, you're a doctor, you're, you're book smart, you're nerdy, Friday, Saturday night, you're, you're in the all library true, all true. studying, right? Whereas you take these guys that are serving overseas, they're the biggest badasses that this country has to offer, and you send them to go fight. Well, on a Friday and Saturday night when you're in the ER in LA, Chicago, New Orleans, right? You see some pretty horrific stuff. Yes. Well, these big badasses that go overseas to defend this country see some pretty horrific stuff too. Probably worse, yeah. Yeah, but why does one group come back with PTSD and the other doesn't? Now, obviously their life is on the line. It's a little bit different. Um, there's some other you know, variables there. But one thing that we don't really discuss is blast injury. So when you're military and you're training, you're exposed, exposed to blast exposure all the time, whether you're right. training with explosive devices, exp, uh, exposed to an explosive device, you're launching you know, planes on a runway. I mean, there is a whole bunch of different things but beyond just getting hit in the head. And when there's a blast in there, there's an extreme amount of overpressure. And that overpressure will do the same thing to your brain as a football player you know, crashing head into a uh, right. middle linebacker. So when they, these guys come back and we treat them as a purely psychological case, we're completely missing the underlying physiological damage that's occurred to their brain. And we went to the military and said, hey, we need to address this because if we address the underlying pathology, then we can make the psychological outcomes easier to achieve. And they agreed with us and that's where we're, we're working to kind of accomplish this, this study right now. Wow. Right, so I, like I have, I have a couple of friends who are vets mm -hmm. and and the, the PTSD component of it, like I always kind of grew up thinking that PTSD was like, oh my God, they saw atrocities of war, you know, they saw people being murdered and that, that it was exactly that psychological, psychologically induced trauma. But yes, there, there is a huge component of it. Like, and, and no one talks about it. I mean, really no one talks about it except oh. for the vets. And they don't even, a lot of them don't even have a forum to do that. So if they don't have even a forum to let people know about it, like how are they gonna get treatment? Absolutely, but also too, I don't think a lot of people understand when you're, you know, they call it shell shock, right? Like you, you know, drop a bomb and there's a big ex uh, explosion, you get shell shock. Well, that's not just, you know, oh wow, it was a loud noise. That's a whole you know, injury that's occurring to your entire body. And um, we actually use that in the military to our advantage. If there's this you know, big uh, gun battle going on, we'll drop a bomb on ourselves, essentially. Basically say, hey, this is gonna scare the crap out of our opponents. It'll give us you know, 15 seconds to recover ahead of them recovering, and then we can get all of our troops out of an area and whatnot. But the amount of damage that that can do to your brain is, is crazy. And then we don't address it. And that's what you have to do. You have to address it. You got to take care of it. The, the danger close drops. Yeah. It's, it, ha it happens a lot, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it, and it's, it's sad, but we got to take care of it. Plus, I never you even have, thought of that. Even, even, but even on a simple standpoint, you have people training with weapons all the time, right? So if you're training with automatic you know, rifles or if you're training with you know, just explosive but, devices, you can only use so many a week and then you're limited. Well, and there's a lot, I mean, there's, there's, there is impact of just small arms fire. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So just, just the, I mean, there is a blast wave. I, I'm really into guns and stuff. Yeah. So like, I mean, you, you, sh you shoot a gun. I mean, if you, I don't know, have you ever shot a 50 caliber? No, uh-uh. I mean, that thing will knock you on your ass. Yeah. And if you're sitting there just repeatedly firing a 50 caliber, I mean that's that that like it I'm shakes from, you it I'm, shakes you to your core. I'm from LA, where do you think I get a 50 caliber out here? <laughs> well, you're not gonna get it in LA. You know what I mean, <laughs> I don't own one. <laughs> I had to fly to Wyoming and to Vegas to shoot it. The yeah, tough yeah, streets yeah. of LA. Yeah, yeah. No, but but if any, if anyone has a 50 caliber that they want to offload, I'm totally open to it. <laughs> mount it on the bears I'm, that are coming to your house. I'm gonna tonight, mount it right? on the roof yeah. of my house. Yeah, yeah exactly. So okay, so. Um, Let's back up. I want I want people to, our viewers, listeners, to understand what we're, what we're talking about when we're talking about stem cells because it's it is a um, it is a very diverse topic, right? Uh, it's a controversial topic in in my industry, right? Uh, plastic surgery, you know. 
like your dad. I, I knew your dad uh, before he passed, and um, he. I, I too do a lot of fat transfer, right? So we we do fat transfer. We've been talking about in plastic surgery at meetings doing fat transfer for years, and and there are many plastic surgeons and what I call paraplastic surgeons who um, are maybe marketing that they're doing stem cell treatments when they're just doing fat. So, you know, like what's the difference between me going in and doing liposuction on a patient, harvesting their fat, and then immediately injecting it either into their face or into, a, into a, a, an old wound or a, a liposuction defect or into their breasts, which I do a lot of now, uh, what's the difference between that and stem cell treatments, which, right, it's, it's kind of harvested the same way, but the process and how you go about isolating it is completely different, right? Can you explain? Yeah, that? absolutely. I think the first thing that, that's important for your viewers to know is there's stem cells throughout your entire body, right? Right. I mean, they're in all tissues throughout your body, and that's how we heal naturally, you know, throughout the course of time. Um, but when it comes to fat, your fat's a really complex tissue and organ in your body. You have adipocytes, which are those big cells that are filled with grease and lipid and oil. For us, with the stem cell treatments that we're doing, we don't want those. They don't really provide any benefit for us. For a fat transfer, that's great because it gives you that volume that you right. really want. Right, right, right. But so when you do a fat transfer, you have those adipocytes in there. You use them. They give you the volume that you're desiring. And there are, there are in fact, adipose-derived stem cells mixed in like when i do liposuction mm -hmm. there are it, it i mean it technically in the general sense there it is a stem cell treatment oh absolutely i don't is. call it a stem cell yeah. treatment um but there are ways to get more concentrated stem cells right yeah absolutely so, so your your fat is is got a ton of it's got a ton of cells in it so adipocytes but it's got adipose derived mesenchymal stem cells things we call hematopoietic stem cells these can turn into blood product very easy Pericytes and preadipocytes, these are also progenitor type these, cells. These are all things we learn in medical school that you probably, you're like, what the hell oh is he talking God. about? <laughs> but don't worry. Like the, the whole, the, yeah, so <laughs> these, these, are, these are different types of, these are different types Sean's of cells. describing different types be, of cells. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And what we can do is we can collect them, right? Right. And it's kind of like if you went fishing and you threw a net out there right. and you pulled back you know, everything you got, maybe you get out in the LA River here, you get a lot of tires and boots, but maybe there are a couple fish in there. Right. And the fish are like the stem cells, and the tire and boots are kind of like the fat cells. Okay. But they're all bound by a collagen matrix, and they're all tied together. So if we can separate them, we can easily separate out, you know, the fish, the stem cells, from the boots and the tires, which would be the fat cells. And when we do that, we can concentrate the stem cells, and then we can use them for a more regenerative or, you know, uh, a way to promote healing in a natural way with our patients. And we can put them all over the body and let them do what Mother Nature designed them to do. I like your analogy. I like the fishing analogy. My, the analogy I use is uh, to explain it to patients is like the difference between uh, a margarita, which is fat transfer, and a tequila shot, right? Yeah. It's, it's a much more great. concentrated yeah. version of, what, of what's good. Shot. That's a lot more fun. I, so I, I went to Amherst <laughs> you know, College undergrad. I was an English major and pre-med. So right. that's where it's like, okay, how do I describe it to my football teammates so that they actually understand what we're talking about? And I think they probably would have got the uh, tequila and the margarita one. So I'll hold on to that one. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Most college students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, so how do you then, or how do, uh, maybe you're not specifically doing it, but you're coordinating it, but how do the people in the lab, once, once they get the end product, so uh, let's, uh, let's do a start to finish to explain to patients how this goes, right? Yeah. Or to our viewers who may be patients, how it goes. Patient comes in, Surgeon like me takes a little bit of fat. Tablespoon of fat. I mean, we're, we're, Tablespoon we're talking about 50 cc, so it's a real small amount wow. of, of fat. Okay. And we do it all under local anesthesia. That's a big um, tablespoon, 50 cc. Well, 50 cc lipoaspirate. It okay. ends up being about 25 cc of condensed fat, okay. so it's, it's pretty small. Um, and then from that, we can enzymatically uh, break apart the, the fishnet or the collagen matrix that binds all those different cell types together. Right. You do that? We do that in the OR. In the OR or at the time, or yeah, at shortly the time. thereafter, it's the fat's harvest. Right after the fat comes out, it goes into an incubator and a centrifuge. So the incubator breaks down the fishnet. Once the fishnet is broken down, you have adipocytes, which are you know like an oil slick, right? You spill oil, they're going to rise to the top. Your stem cells are real tiny and dense. They're going to fall to the bottom. So you could just decant it and separate them naturally. If you centrifuge it, then it speeds it up, and we can isolate those stem cells very, very easily 
all happens within about an hour. Um, we filter them through a 100 micron filter, which allows us to then give the cells back any way we That's like. That's really small. Okay. Like Very tiny. Um, so I have a question. Just yeah. is fat the only place that you can get stem cells, or is there other ways to extract stem cells? Great question. You can get stem cells everywhere in your body, right? So a couple popular sources right now that your viewers might have heard of would be cord blood, cord tissue. It's right. really popular. Bone marrow has a ton of stem cells in it. Fat has a ton of stem cells in it. If I wanted the youngest stem cells in my body and the you know most potent, robust. I'd probably go for my liver. And I, I didn't drink heavily last night, even though it was St. Patrick's Day, but like <laughs> you, you can chop off half your liver and it'll regenerate. Oh, Why does wow. it regenerate? Because it's got so many stem cells in it. And unless you're you know, constantly drinking and putting a lot of stress on your liver so those stem cells are having to work, the stem cells in there are gonna be pretty robust and really young. But, but harvesting from your liver, it's a little trickier. People are opposed to that. It's, well, it's trickier and more complications Absolutely. potentially, right? So, so we look for easy sources that we can pull right. young, healthy, robust you know, lines of stem cells. And if you're younger, um, your bone marrow can be a good source. But that but that's like the Dickens when you're trying to get it out, right? Yeah, it can hurt. And also there's like 500 to 2,000 times fewer stem cells in your bone marrow compared to your adipose. Okay. So your adipose, most people, people pay you to take out fat all day long, right? Every week. So yeah. they come in, you're like, hey, can I'll take some fat out and I can isolate stem cells that are good from there? They're like, great. Like, and can I donate can do, more? And put it in my face, right? Like, right. Well, right. So we do that and I'll do fat transfer. But, you know, we, the, the biggest problem with fat transfer, whether to the breast, face, or anywhere else, is that we lose a certain percentage of it because it doesn't all survive. Right. So that's not necessarily directly because of the stem cell concentration. But what if we were able to do it and, and, and you are like, hey, Kevin, I have, uh, I have this patient's stem cells saved, banked, and amplified, and we're gonna go mix it in. How does that help a patient? I mean, so in, in theory, you could take one stem cell, and in theory, you could replicate it 10 to the 31st times, which is an insane amount of times, and that's enough to make human bodies to populate the world seven times over. No one's actually doing that. That's we, don't, just, we don't want to do that. We, got, we, don't, have, we got too many people. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then too, it would be me, and you don't want that many people with me. You know? So um, no, we, need, we, need, we need people like you. That's, that's very sweet, but I think a lot of people would disagree with you. Um, <laughs> my girlfriend, I'll get her out here, and she'll be like, no, 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 we're good. She's, <laughs> she's, like, she's like, no, what is one of them. <laughs> that's too much, yeah, send them away for a little while, too. But yeah, you can take just a little bit of fat and you can isolate the stem cells from there. And in a GMP, which is good manufacturing practice, so like, you know, you've seen the pictures of a, what looks like a sterile spaceship laboratory in kind of right. one of those settings, so you don't risk any disease transmission or anything like that. You can grow those stem cells out and they'll just self replicate if they're put in the right conditions. Bottle them up and you freeze them. And then when patients want, they can get those back whenever they want. And, and, they, and they have a better shelf life freezing than fat cells, right? I mean, I, you know, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but when I was uh, in between my general surgery and my plastic surgery residencies, I actually spent a year in the tissue engineering lab oh, cool. doing primarily chondrocyte research, that's cartilage cells, but we also did some fat research and stuff. Fat, fat the survivability of fat and then its ability to then regrow once you defrost it, so to speak. Is not, is not as good as stem cells, it's, right? It's tricky. It's tricky because yeah. it's hard to freeze fat. And if you think about how the fat cells look versus your stem cells, and then you have the lipid concentration, whatever, it's, it's hard to freeze them down and then get them all back. But if you can just isolate the stem cells, they actually store, you can put them in minus 90, you know, liquid nitrogen for ever. That's cold. So yeah. I said, it's, cold, uh, it's colder than I, the studio. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> So essentially you would have your own line of stem cells, right? Like I yeah. can have my own line of, of, of stem cells. Absolutely. Right. So, and then you mentioned uh, core blood, cord blood, not core blood. Cord, cord blood is from the umbilical cord, right? right? I mean, I have both of my kids, we bank their cord blood. Mm -hmm. It's off at a company, I'm not gonna say the name, but you probably know. And, it's, uh, and, it's, uh, and I've been paying for them to store it for 12 and 14 years. How do I then go from taking the cord blood and turning it into usable stem cells, right? Do you want it's, to do that on this it, show? Because the whole cord blood thing- It's tricky, right? The whole cord blood banking thing is like a crazy scam to a degree that you could get into. Because if go try and call them. No. Let me know what happens this week. We were, he you was just get, talking about that. You can't get that. those cells back. 
Right. Uh, under what circumstances? It's like, it's it's like people at Silicon Valley Bank right now. They can't get their money back. You can, actually, they're going to have a better chance of getting their money back at Silicon Valley Bank than you are getting your cord blood back for your kids. It's crazy. Oh, that's crazy. And yeah. I was feeling so guilty because I didn't I yeah. didn't know at the time. They, these, but these companies feel guilty. <laughs> terrible mother for not doing <laughs> <I know>. that. <laughs> no, but, okay, so now you know. So your next kid, you can, you can save you know, the cord blood, cord tissue. But it's crazy. They've stored like 4 million samples privately uh, in the country, of which I think about 400 samples have ever been given back. So what's, wow. what's the red tape there? You have to be in a FDA-approved... Um, you know, uh, clinical trial. It's only for certain kind of rare um, blood cancers. And the kid that you banked can't actually get their own cells back. It has to be a match for a, a brother or sister. <gasps> so yeah, there, there, there's some weird stuff in there. And then it's like you have to go to a certain trial that you can only do at like Duke or whatever. And then that costs, you know, an insane amount of oh money to enroll God. in. So it's not what people exactly think. You'd really like it to be like your financial bank account where, hey, I'm going to deposit this and right. yeah. I'd like to get it back whenever I can. Like, oh, and by the way, why don't you guys invest it smartly and wisely while I'm waiting and make some more of it so that when right, I come like back, so, there's no So, like, I can't, I can't call up the cord blood company mm -hmm. and say, hey, I need my daughter's cord blood. I want to expand it. Mm -hmm. Send it to CSN. Yeah. No, send it to yourself. You're a licensed physician. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, but I'm not going to expand it. No, no, no. I, no. I don't have the infrastructure for right. that, but you do. Yeah. Right? So, or no, send I, it to I, me. I don't I, at CSN. We use a third party to do it for us. Right. Or yeah. I don't even know who that third party yeah. is. So I'd still call you. Yeah. So that's yeah, no, I'll, I'll point <laughs> in that um, direction. Um, but you can't do that, right? You can try. I don't think it's going to be very successful. Okay. Wow. So, so um, all right. Well, next thing is how do you then take this progenitor stem cell, how does it know where it's, where it's gonna go to work, right? So you have this, um, what do you call them, um, omnipotent stem cells, that they can kinda go, they can kinda, they're de-differentiated, right? They have not yet picked which cell line that they're gonna differentiate to, yeah. right? You can have a stem cell and it, it can turn into a bone, like an osteocyte bone cell, it can turn into a blood cell, it can turn into a muscle cell. Mm -hmm. um, there are various applications for stem cells, right? Absolutely, almost, ton. almost infinite number. Anything that you got in anywhere. Here, so, so how do we how do we say to you know the generation one stem cell? Okay, we're gonna have you go. Uh, you know, I tore my calf on a hike last year. Mm -hmm. And it's all scarred in now. I want to put stem cells in there. Yeah. How how does it know? Because I'm not injecting it directly into the calf necessarily, right? But they, you could. But they go. You go into the the vein. But then how how does it know to differentiate to muscle cells versus so, versus uh, a skin? You know, like a, a skin, cell in your skin. It's a great question. Um, so first of all, sorry about your calf. If I would have known, we would have said, hey, get stem cells right away. Because your body heals in two different ways. It can either heal with stem cells or fibroblasts. Fibroblasts form scar. So it's like if you were to you know, knock a hole in the drywall and you would just put duct tape over it, that's kind of like a fibroblast. Hey, it you know, patches it up, it does a job. Right. But if you were to put a hole in the wall and you actually you know, repatched re it and, and whatnot with more drywall, that would be like a stem cell. And, uh, so we can do multiple things with stem cells. We can put it as close to the site of injury as possible, which makes it easy on the stem cell, and it'll pick up signals from the injured tissue. As tissue is injured, it, it secretes all these, what we call fancy, in fancy terms, cytokine signal, it's just cell signals, right? Saying, hey, help. And that'll attract stem cells. And when you're younger, you have a lot of stem cells, so those stem cells will come in and they'll actually repair with like tissue. Well, when we're older, we deplete a lot of those stem cells, so we have more fibroblasts, and that's where you get more duct tape, and that's why everything kind of aches and pains and is Creaks annoying. And yeah, as yeah. Wait until you're my age, yeah. And you get up and you're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> right? And start so, making weird noises so when you You sound like up. an old Jewish man like yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I can do that for fun anyway. But, um, <laughs> but the other great property that stem cells have, and that's what I've kind of taken advantage of with the concussion research, is that they will home in to sites of inflammation. So if I give stem cells IV, or if I get stem cells IV, they will go all over my body and end up wherever there is inflammation. And if you have degenerative cells and they're breaking down, they're releasing these cytokine signals which cause inflammation, right. and the cells will home there. 
So even if, you mean, do, even if you don't necessarily know where the inflammation is, and we, the, where we've talked about this is patients with like breast implant illness, uh -huh. right? Who have, who we think have this sort of generalized immunologic inflammatory response, mm -hmm. almost like a systemic inflammatory response, right? I mean, I have a handful of patients who have had stem cells injected who were kind of waiting for surgery and it, and for whatever reason, a lot of their symptoms abated temporarily, right? Mm -hmm. Just uh, following the stem cell injections, yeah. which is super interesting. It doesn't, it's, it's hard to kind of comprehend that, right? Yeah, it, it's weird, but that's where, you know, I think we're smart, I, you know, I think we're smart. I think my, my father and his partner and, you know, all the doctors that we work with are really, really smart guys. But we're not that smart and we're not that conceited that we're saying, hey, we're smarter than Mother Nature. Mother Nature's been working at this whole thing for a long time. And all we're doing it is kind of taking advantage of it. So Learning from Mother Nature. Yeah, there's stem cells in your fat. And you go back and you say, well, why are there stem cells in my fat? If you think about it back to like caveman time, how many, how many animals do you think you killed a week? One, if you were lucky? And we're Jewish. We're probably not really good at doing that stuff, you know? Like, I mean, we're probably you guys are going to yeah. pay somebody to do that yeah, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I know my husband's but, uh, Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, okay, you kill one animal a week. Well, you better have stem cells in your fat to turn into more fat so that you can store all those nutrients and energy for the next week while you're out trying to kill something. And we're Jewish. So we're in the desert. There's not much stuff to kill, right? Um, or, so, or in the Arctic Circle, like on a loan. Can yeah. you see the loan? Mm -mm. These guys, they go do survival oh, for yeah, three yeah, months yeah. in the Arctic. Yeah. Well, that, that's crazy. But, <laughs> but that's why you have all these stem cells in your fat. And now when we have McDonald's or Whole Foods or whatever your you know, food of choice is down the street, you don't, you don't need to have those stem cells in your fat. That's kind of an old archaic uh, thing that we have going on. So all we're doing is taking advantage of this store of natural stem cells right. and saying, hey, these things can either give cells a good signal to help them regenerate, or they can turn into uh, the appropriate tissue for regeneration, and they'll home in to sites of inflammation. You go do your thing. We can try and put them as close to the site of injury as possible to make it easier on them, or we can just let them you know, flow through the bloodstream. So this all sounds like magical, right? This sounds like the magic bullet in medicine, mm -hmm. right? Why the controversy? Why the controversy and how did this land as a uh, FDA litigation battle. Yeah, well, I can't tell you why people have problems with it. I can, I can suggest, or I'll sit here and be a conspiracy theorist or whatever, but I'll put it out there. What we have with people's own stem cells, they're your, it's your own cell with your own DNA. I can't patent it, we can't own it, we can't mass produce it. It takes a guy like this that's gone through medical school for four years, residency for another four, fellowship, all this extra training. It was to, nine, nine years of residency. Not, oh, <laughs> so you go through all this training and you have to perform a one-on-one -on -one service for somebody where you isolate their stem cells and give them back to them, okay? That's, that's hard. But what you can do with their stem cells can maybe bypass a lot of what these patented drugs and pharmaceutical products will, you know, you keep someone on for a really, really long time. So you have something that's not patentable and not mass producible and it takes a really highly qualified individual to intervene with as opposed to just writing a script to masking an injury. Oh, and then with your stem cells, you could actually heal the injury as opposed to you know, having somebody on kind of like sick care for the rest of time. So I think it really upsets the apple cart in traditional medicine, and that's where I'm really excited about it being kind of the future of medicine, which is, hey, how do we promote healing in a natural way? Um, so t can you elaborate a little bit more though about the ruling last, the FDA yeah, ruling yeah. last year, because that that was that was really important. Yeah, it was huge, and, and probably not as widely publicized as it should have been. Unfortunately, that's where a director of operations of Cell Surgical Network, that title that I have, I feel like I'm doing a terrible job. But well, in, you're doing it right now. Yeah, yeah, thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, 2017, the FDA came to our offices and said, "Hey, by the way, this whole thing where you're taking out fat and you're making stem cells from it and giving it back, that's drug manufacture." And because you're manufacturing a drug, we regulate that. And because you haven't gotten approved by us, we're going to shut you down. Right. And, and so how, which is kind of crazy making, like how can, how can they say that your, your own tissue is a drug, 
right? Because you're manipulating it in a lab. They consider that a drug. We don't manipulate it in a lab. We do it. We well, pull you do. Up. You do manipulate it. You allow it to grow. I mean, you're not. Oh, well, you're not changing it. Well, the, you're amplifying that, it. that 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 portion. We amplify it for sure. But if you're just operating bedside and you pull out fat and you isolate the stem cells and you give them right back to the patient, there's no manipulation whatsoever. It's right. just yeah. pure stem cells. The same way you do a fat transfer, give it back. We do a, you know, if, if, um, and adipose harvest and we give it right back to the patient so there's nothing to worry about there essentially but the fda came in and said hey you guys are making stem cells that's a drug and we regulate that and in 2018 they filed for a permanent injunction against us uh yeah so that's not really fun and they put out all this press release about how terrible we are and everybody trusts the fda and they basically say oh well if the fda says it's about you then you guys must be a criminal and you know see you later and by the way i'm going to rip on the fda a little bit I'm not opposed to FDA. I think that they have a great purpose for regulating drugs and mass-produced pharmaceuticals. That's important. And I think they, you know, got a little bit confused I'm with somewhere us. in the middle. Like, I, I That's a whole, whole other show, yeah. right? No, because, absolutely. Because right. there's, I mean, especially in the last three, four years, yeah. um, since every, everything with COVID and the, and the vaccine development and then all the pharmaceuticals associated with treatment, like, right, there's a lot of... Uh, doubt and distrust in terms of the process sure i agree with you they serve an important function but there, but but there are like anything else there are problems yeah. with their process well, big big problems so here, here's here's one for you and viewers which will be fun so they came they said by take, making these stem cells which we don't make anything we isolate them um you're manufacturing a drug do you know the definition of a drug according to the fda tell me anything that can treat <laughs> cure, mitigate, diagnose, or prevent disease constitutes a drug. So you're dehydrated. Right. Drug. Drug. Right. right? Water is a drug. If you are vitamin D deficient, you go outside and you have some sunshine, sunshine's a drug because that's a cure. So when we went to court, so we fought this battle since 2018. The FDA said, hey, you guys need to you know, abide by our rules and everything, sign this consent decree or else. We said, no, we're, all we're doing is practicing surgery. We have licensed medical doctors that, you know, that have been in practice for decades that are doing this stuff. It's actually a very conservative procedure. No way, we're not making anything, we're just practicing surgery, medicine. So anyway, we went to court with the FDA and we actually, we defeated their motion for summary judgment, which nobody has ever done. And then we go to a two week trial with the FDA where they basically were tasked with having to prove that we change the character of the cell and we more than minimally manipulate the stem cell. And, oh my God, they, they came and they said, you know, we add an enzyme to the, to the adipose so that we can separate the stem cells from the adipose. And that, that was the crux of their argument? Was yeah, that? and they, they said, look, we've got 36 papers to show that you more that, that, that adding an enzyme changes the character of the cell. Here are the 36 pub, peer-reviewed published papers. And you're like, oh my God, like we're toast. And we looked at them. Well, not one paper had to do with the enzyme that we use, and not one paper had to do with the tissue adipose that we're working with. It was all about a random enzyme on a random tissue or cell. And if you remember back to basic bio in like third grade. I don't. It, well, you probably do. Enzyme is a lock and key mechanism. So it's very, very, very specific. Right. So you have 36 examples that are non-specific to what we're doing. In what world are you bringing this up? And that was kind of the stuff that we were up against. You know? uh, 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 for, for anyone who doesn't know, an enzyme, all an enzyme does is accelerate a reaction, right? Yeah. Uh, um, so, I'm learning and, so much and we today. Have, we have enzymes for a zillion things in our body. It, uh, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't produce the reaction. It just accelerates it. So. And it's extremely specific to whatever it does. Right. That lock and key. See, you remember third grade. You're on top of things. Well, I, I may have repeated it in, uh, I don't know, in, nine co years in of college, nine years of residency, <laughs> medical school. Yeah. Um, all right. So, Sean, do you think that down the road, and like so many people are mm -hmm. antidepressants and, you know, have mental health, it's helping with our veterans, but do you think that eventually that could help like mainstream too with people that have mental, uh, mental health? Uh, I hope abilities. so. Um, it depends on where the mental health, it depends on the origin of the problem. Right. So there, it's really important that people know there's some things that stem cells won't do. They won't fix scar tissue. We can't reverse that. So if whatever is going on because you have some scarring in your brain or something like that is for leading to this mental health problem, we can't reverse that. But if there's an ongoing disease and uh, degradation of whatever tissue it is we're talking about, 
yeah, we can try and slow that down, prevent that, and turn back you know, the clock a little bit on the cells. So basically the past five years, we've been really slowed down because we've been fighting this lawsuit. There's a lot of work left to do to you know, speed things back up to where we were from maybe 2017 and get back to the studies that we want to do. And that's why you know, this Air Force study that we're involved in, I think is so exciting. And there's so many other things that we're getting bit, picked back up again. So there's a lot left to be done. So take us down the process mm -hmm. of like, let's say a regular person that's not, has no medical history or a, a, a medical background or anything. They have an ailment and they want to do stem cell. Mm -hmm. What is, take us down that road of what they need to do or how do they access it or where do they get it from? Well, first of all, you need to talk to your doctor to make sure that your ailment is something that stem cells might be good for, right? right? So that's the first thing, and right. it's, uh, you know, to throw it out there. And, and I, I would argue that a lot of doctors don't, wouldn't necessarily know if stem cells are a treatment option, right? Yeah. I and mean, there's a lot of things that I, I don't, I mean, I, I'm, I kind of am in the world, and I don't know that it's going to treat X, Y, or Z necessarily. Yeah, so a lot how of do people we, how don't. Do we, how do you find that so out? So be careful if someone promises you a panacea, right? Like right. That, that's, that's important. There's a lot of published literature out there. You know, go talk to your doctor, somebody that you, you, you trust, and if someone's promised you knew everything, then kind of be a, a little Weary. bit worried. Yeah. I think one of the most important things when it comes to stem cells and the cellular therapy is you want to be safe. And you can basically be guaranteed that you're being safe if you're using your own cells. These are your own cells with your own DNA. They're not somebody else's DNA that you could reject um, and have long-term, you know, graffers host disease response right. to and, it. And they're not from an animal. Yeah, they're not from right. an animal. That was, that was... You know that people are using, like, bunny rabbit stem cells for erectile dysfunction issues? And, you know, it kind of gets... Kind of makes sense there's out of a so comic many, book. So, but wow. many, but okay. so much potential for jokes. There. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I'm, I'm dead serious. This is real. Like that, that stuff. That stuff is out. Oh there. no, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you know, talk talk to your doctor. There's a lot of great published work out there. Um, we have a lot on our website, cellsurgicalnetwork.com, that we've published. So you can see where we're studying whether it's you know neurodegenerative conditions or orthopedic conditions or urologic conditions. Um, but really, you know, at least stick to your own cells and then talk to a doctor that you trust. And if they don't know, then yeah, I guess you could go, uh, you know, reach out and uh, check so out. Give us, us a list of website. ailments that can help. Oh, man. Well, low-hanging fruit or orthopedic conditions. Um, okay. Just uh, acute injuries, like new, new injuries or kind of chronic older injuries? So because, because stem cells are new... People try everything else first, and then right. they're told they're going to get a total hip replacement or a total knee replacement, all this major surgery. Then they come to us. So everything we've been doing, we've been working with the hardest cases first. But the best time to treat an injury is in the acute phase. That's when the, the you know that cytokine cell signal is the loudest, and you can you know get the cells to the site of injury and actually get a response. And don't you don't get all that duct tape. C that's right. put Cytokines up. are the little chemicals that one cell signals to another. It's like oh, it's like, okay. a, like like a little like a little dinghy going from one boat to the other. A little cellular text message. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right? Yeah, okay. So, um, so if you can treat right away, that's great. But as this is a new technology and emerging, people are trying everything else first, whether it's NSAIDs or steroids or you know whatever. But that's allowing those fibroblasts and that scar to build up, and you know again we're getting to the hardest things and we're having great you know success with it so we've treated over 6900 uh, knee arthritis patients oh wow and almost 83% of them are responding one and done that's a big percentage it's huge it's awesome yeah. but what if we could get to that before you know they tried everything else and they came to us 5 years later right but that's the evolution of a new technology awesome interesting all right yeah. well there's always a question we ask our guests there is uh oh and that no it's, it's that's not that. <laughs> so um yeah, I, 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 the reason that we always ask this is because I want to know. So if you were not doing, if you were not the director of operations for <laughs> Cell Surgical Network, if you were not, didn't have this sort of passion for stem cells and kind of following your dad's foot, footsteps and taking the torch, what do you think you would have done with your life? Um, I absolutely know. Well, I, I wanted to be Tom Brady. And then that didn't work out, so you, you, only, you only get so far. Um, I have the utmost respect for medical doctors. 
I think you guys are by far and away the smartest, most talented people on the face of the planet. Right, your dad really pulled the wool over your no, eyes. Uh, huh? No, 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 he, he didn't. <laughs> you guys just allow yourselves to be treated like garbage. We do. Which is, which have, is a huge problem. You're, you're 100% right. But about guess that. what? If you've got you know, the biggest bank account in the world and you get, you know, you're riding your bike down the street, you get hit and you're in a ditch. Um, who's the author? I'm blanking on the author who did it, who said it, but he's like, you only need two things at that point. You need a good God and a good doctor. And that puts you above kings and queens and everything. So I wanted to go to medical school. And that was something that I was planning to do. And then I got sucked into this world of stem cells and the research opportunities. I love solving problems. That's why I like football. Football is three seconds to make a decision or else you get smacked really hard and you know you got to go back to it again. Well, stem cells are kind of like football, except you get to use your brain. You don't have to get hit. And it's not as physical. And um, there are a lot of problems that we can solve with this kind of new technology and taking advantage of it. So I, I love that I'm in this world, but I would have loved to become a, a doctor. Well, we need young voices like yours to come and, and change things. And, you know, um, Dr. Brenner's talked to me about your dad and how he was on the cutting edge of, of stem cells. So, you know, we need the young voices to come out and, and change a lot of things. So, you know, thank you for doing this work. Well, thank you. Yeah. But I also plan on using my stem cells for a long time. I'm going to be about 175. Yeah. So I figure if I enroll in medical school at like Perfect. 60, you got time. You'd be fine. You still got time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, right. Sean, could you look into the camera there and yeah. tell people you know, any social media or your website or anything like that that could be Phone number. How, how, how do people get a hold of you? Single, you can, say, no, you can just... send me a fax. Uh, I forget my fax number. No, <laughs> I, I don't have much social media. You can find me on LinkedIn. My name is Sean Berman. Um, you can find our website. It's cellsurgicalnetwork.com. Um, I also host a conference every summer. It's called Cell Surgical Conference. It's stem cells, exosomes, peptides, PRP, Everything that can kind of help you heal naturally. So those are some of the things I'm involved in. But I social media, it. oh my God, I'm a, I'm a dinosaur in that thing. So wow. just send me a handwritten letter. You're instead. a unicorn. You, because... you, don't, you don't have a Snap account? Yeah. No, no. A 14 year old has a Snapchat account. Yeah, well, you know, stem cells, I'm trying to turn back the clock, but not that far. I love peptides, by the way. I take peptides. Me too. Yeah. I think oh. they're great. Yeah. Anything that can promote healing naturally, where we're not, where we're doing something the body's used to, that's awesome. I agree. That's, so. a, that's a whole other show. Yes. All right. Well, Thank you for coming on. Hey, man. Thanks, thanks for, for having me. It was so, good to be here. So good to see thanks, you. Thanks, Sean. So nice to meet you. And keep doing the great work. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today for this amazing episode. And be sure to like, subscribe, and follow on all of our platforms. We will see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to Beyond the OR with Dr. Brenner. Make sure to subscribe, like, and follow so you don't miss any future episodes. In the meantime, hit me up on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Kevin Brenner MD and KevinBrennerMD.com.